Good morning. As we say that Easter is a big day, Easter is a special day, we are accurate, that's true, that, that, that's a true statement. I want to lean into that a little bit today because it's right down the alley that this sermon uh, takes us. I want to lean into that a little bit today and say, if I were to ask you, well, why is Easter a big day, what might you say? Don't answer out loud, but that's what we're talking about today. Today is a super practical ser sermon. If I preach it correctly, it should be a sermon that you can take and use with your friends. When I was a child, actually when I was a teenager, um, I would sometimes go with my youth pastor, who was a dear, dear man. Uh, in fact, many of us at the church, we would, we, we, would, we would do this, what I'm about to tell you, on a regular basis. I would go with my youth pastor, and we would go. And we, sometimes we would go to a home, we would, not sometimes, we would go to a home, uh, sometimes a stranger, sometimes a person that we didn't know, uh, but a person who had visited the church a time or two. And we would knock on the door, and at some point, we would get to this, this really traumatic question, and I, it sounds like I'm making fun, and I'm not, because it was all born out of really precious hearts for people. But ultimately, we would get to this really traumatic question that went something like, um, if you were to die, and I certainly hope you don't, uh, but if you were to die, and you were to stand before God, and He were to say, why should I let you into my heaven what would you say, right? That's like a jaw-dropping, almost offensive kind of a question, but we would ask that. And what I, I don't want to dwell on the question, but what I, what I do want to dwell on right now is if that approach to seeing the lost come to faith, if that approach was effective in that day, I want to say that 40 35, 40 years later, that era has probably come and gone, and if you are going to be an effective sharer of your faith, which some of us in this room feel a desire to be, if you're going to be an effective sharer of your faith, it's going to happen in this sweet spot in your life where the two different worlds in which you live converge. And you, the, the, the kingdom of God in which you live as a Christ follower is going to collide with the kingdom of this world in which you also live in. And your unbelieving friends are going to somehow be connected or come into contact with this kingdom of God that you live in. And they're going to be confronted in the most beautiful way. Said another way, super practically, if you are largely friendless, you are probably not going to be an incredibly effective evangelist. Because that's where the sharing of your faith is going to happen in this day and age, is within your friend group. It's a really important reason for us to have friends who are unbelievers and to not be like super offensive in their lives on like secondary issues before we ever get to Jesus. Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament, used to talk about how we don't want to put anything in the way of our unbelieving friends that causes them to trip before they get to Jesus as the tripping point, because like that, the story of Jesus, which we're going to talk about today, that is a really big hurdle for your friends to, to, to clear. And so Paul used to say, let's not put other secondary, superficial expectations in front of our unbelieving friends such that they trip on that before they ever get to Jesus. Okay. A little bit of background, or that's a little bit of groundwork. We're going to do a little more groundwork before we actually get to the text. Um, what I want to do today is I want to give you um, a message, share with you a message that some of you know well, uh, some of you maybe you need a refresher course on, a, a message such that you, because you're not friendless, you do have friends, a message that you can sit down over a cup of coffee uh, over a lunch, 
Uh, and you can share with your friends, uh, if they were to ask you, if your friends were to ask you, like, what is, what is the deal with the church? Like, what do you guys believe? Or maybe perhaps an even more insightful <clears throat> or cerebral sort of a question that they might ask you would be, what is the deal with the blood and guts of Jesus? Like, like the whole bleeding and dying on a cross thing. What's up with that? I believe as a church, we've got two really, really lazy tendencies. We've got two really, really lazy tendencies as a church. One is we, <clears throat> we don't really fully explain why Jesus had to die on a cross, why God, the eternal Father, cleared the, the highest hurdle that's ever been cleared in determining I will sacrifice my son for humanity. I will do that. We don't explain that. We're a bit lazy. And so we just throw out, you know, statements like, well, Jesus died on the cross for you, which makes no sense to your unbelieving friends uh, until you explain it. And maybe it makes no sense to you, but we're going to look at, 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 at what the Bible says. And then you can decide, like, that's a bridge too far. Because some Christians, they do that. They're like, or some non-Christians. Like, you, t you tell them the story of Jesus, and like, that's a bridge too I cannot, that's, that's like a super galactic Star Wars kind of, I can't, I can't wrap my brain around that. And, and okay, well, everyone has that freedom to, to decide that, but let's at, least, let's at least explain in full color, why did Jesus have to die on a cross? Okay, so one, one lazy tendency that we have as, as a church when it comes to sharing our faith, inviting people into the body of Christ, one lazy tendency is we just we don't fully explain, because maybe we don't fully understand what Jesus was doing up there on the cross. The second lazy tendency that we have is, is to, to merely express the message of uh, God is love, as though that is the, the, the complete, the full message of Christianity, which, of course, it's not. That is true. God is love. And it is true that, that we will be known by our love, that people will see our love and they will say, those are, those are Christians, they're Christ followers. But that is not the complete, the only, the full story of Christianity. And so to, to make it nothing more than that, I mean, there are churches that have, that have come and gone and now be made, being made into um, car washes. Uh, even locally, because that is not that is not the complete message. In fact, I would say that really doesn't have staying power. God is love when the world around you has gone awry. So today I want to give you a message that you can maybe scribble down on a piece of paper uh, so that your friends might have a better understanding of what the church really believes. Now I realize some of you did today here in this room are not, in fact, Christ followers. And so I also want today to be like a today is the day sort of a message for you. If you're a skeptic, if you are an unbeliever, if you are irreligious, um, you've come here for some reason. Maybe you want to just kind of figure out what, what we believe. And so today's a great day to be here. And perhaps today could be the day um, in which you, you come to faith. Over the course of my decades of leading the church, um, I have seen supernatural changes in people's lives and hearts and minds where they go from being, and this is a, this is a metaphor, a spiritual, spiritual metaphor that we find in the Bible, where people go from, from death to life, spiritual deadness to spiritual aliveness. And I've seen it in you, some of you in this room, even in the last 10 years, something awakens in you, and you are able to see spiritual matters in a new light. Things that used to not make sense now make sense. Pastor Billy and I were having this discussion just this week. There are people who read spiritual matters 
and, and, and they get it. And there are people who read of spiritual matters, and it makes no sense. And, and what Pastor Billy and I were, were, were discussing is that has nothing to do with, with intelligence. Like, oh, you don't get it because you're not smart enough. It has to do with spiritual deadness and spiritual life. Every Sunday, there are some of you who go away really, really uh, motivated or convicted, not because of my wonderful, powerful preaching, but you, you go away uh, with, with something new that the Lord is... And, and then there are some of you who go away each and every Sunday perplexed, like unable to understand really what is being said on a spiritual level. And, and what is the difference? Again, it is called spiritual deadness, and at some point there is a spiritual awakening which, which leads you to, to a new, it provides for you a new set of eyes through which you can now see spiritual matters in a new light. Now, with that being said, we're going to jump into today's passage. We're going to read it in two parts. We're going to read a section. I'm going to explain it because there's some, there's some difficult things to understand about. And then we're going to read another section. And the second section, I want you to know, is where we're really going to camp out. Section one, Colossians chapter two. Again, by way of review, this is the Apostle Paul's writing. What he thought the, these young believers, not young in age, but young in their faith, but these young believers in the church of Colossae need to, needed to know. Some of them had left pagan religions and and and. and and, and had become Christians. Uh, uh, some of them, uh, most, many of them were not Jewish, but, but some of them, and this is so intriguing and we don't have time to get into this, but if you do a deep dive into the book of Colossians, you'll find that some theologians believe that, that some of these Christian believers, Gentiles, were now thinking maybe they also needed to take up Judaism. Like, I'm a Christian, but now I should also become a, a Jew, and then I'll be super spiritual. And so Paul seems to be uh, waging war on that sort of philosophy. You don't need, no, you don't need more rules. You don't, you don't need another, like, spiritual religious card to pull out. You just need to trust in the work that Jesus did on the cross. With that, let's read Colossians 2, uh, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy. an empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, there's going to be a whole set of masculine pronouns here that reference Jesus, okay? Every time he says him, He's talking about Jesus. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells. And you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also, you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Okay, we're going to stop there for a moment and let's unpack a little bit of this. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this section. What does he say? He says, see to it that no one else... uh, takes you captive with empty ta- uh, teaching, human philosophies. Some of them in that day, some of us in this room today, we are being held captive by human philosophies, other sort of religions that don't center on Jesus Christ and His saving work on the cross. And, and, and Paul is telling the Colossians, but he's telling us today as well, reject the empty philosophical teachings of the world and let's center on Christ 
And then the rest of today's passage is really dominated by this theologically rich explanation of, 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 of who Jesus is in our lives. But let's not just, let's not just ignore this one metaphor. So let's just take a moment, just a moment, and talk about this one metaphor that he uses when he talks about, about being uh, circumcised um, by the circumcision of Christ, not by hands, okay? Now, we're not going to we'll take very little time on this, but, but um, obviously, he's, not, obviously he's, he's talking to a crowd that's thinking about becoming Jewish, maybe not going to be Jewish. Some of them already are Jewish. And, and what he's saying is you don't, you, you don't have to be literally circumcised to be a Christian. You know, we're not talking here about this elective surgery on a little, bit, on a little baby boy. And then he uses this, he turns a corner, he uses this sort of weird metaphor. He talks about the circumcision of, that, that Christ brings in our lives where he removes what he calls the body of flesh. Now let's talk about that for just a moment because we may not get to talk about it again for another year or two because we won't, we won't come to this phrase again. What he is talking about is that Christ literally removes what we might call in, in the English language our sinful nature. Now, the several translations, uh, English translations, use the phrase the body of flesh. We talked about these two words a few weeks ago. Uh, in, in the Greek language, we've got soma, which is body. It's, it's, it's not a moral statement. Uh, it's amoral, just your body, like the, this physical being that you are. And then flesh, uh, sarks, in the Greek language, is, is, is actually your morality, your brokenness, all, all, the, all the, the evil, all of the... So, so um, like the whole body of work that, that, that you know, all, everything you've amassed. <laughs> For some of us, it, it, might, it might more be called a, uh, uh, a, a, a rap sheet, okay? Uh, so, um, two characters that I'll talk about. The, the body of work which defines them. One is, i got to bring it up, maybe I don't, but I will. Anyway, you know, one week ago, the slap heard round the world. And if you didn't, even if you didn't watch the, uh, the Academy Awards, you saw it on TikTok or YouTube or something, right? You saw the slap. And, and the sad thing is that Will Smith, like he's got this incredible body of work. Uh, you may or may not agree with that statement, but he's got an incredible body of work. But then that one thing, it like, it's going to define him for a while, right? Until he overcomes and we'll, you know, we're forgiving. Culturally, we're somewhat forgiving. Uh, and so, uh, so he'll eventually get, but that's, his, that's his, his body of work. Kind of defines him. Uh, and some things, uh, you know, at least within a, within a, human, in a, in a human sense, they define us more than others. And it's the stuff that we just like, man, I wish nobody knew about this. I wish, yeah. Okay, then, then um, man, i got to bring him up as well because he, 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 you know, he finished last night. Coach K, right, Krzyzewski, he's got this incredible body of work. He's, he, coaches, he coaches Duke, and last night they lost in the Final Four, and that's it. He's going out, uh, and, and, and he's, his whole body of work, it defines him. The good, the bad, everything that he's done, like on his own merit, without Jesus in his life, like everything that he's done, that defines who he is. In a sense, when the Apostle Paul talks about our body of flesh, what he's talking, is about, the, what he's talking about is the body of work, all the stuff that I've done, all the ways that I've messed up, all the people that I've hurt, all the stuff that, that in some cases people don't even know about, my sinful nature, and, 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 and Christ on the cross covers that, dismantles that, blows that up. We're going to talk about that. That is what the Apostle Paul means when he says, you, if you're a Christian, you've been circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ. It's a super weird metaphor. I wouldn't use it, but it's all over in the Bible, so you should know what the Apostle Paul means when he says that. All right, now, two really important things in this passage that are going to be the springboard to the next passage we're going to read. Number one is, 
now that we've gotten through that weird metaphor, one thing that he says that's super important in this is he says that, that all the fullness of God dwells in Christ. Before he ever, before he ever uh, talked to, spoke that metaphor, he said, see to it that no one uh, takes you captive by philosophy, empty deceit, human tradition, according to the, elements of the uh, uh, elemental spirits of the world. And he says, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. He says that. So, really important that you realize that all of the fullness of God dwells in Christ. Jesus Christ being the member of the Trinity who, who came to earth as the God-man, the incarnate, the incarnate one. He, he, uh, he really good, good way of, of translating John 1, he moved into our neighborhood or our territory. He came to town. Jesus Christ, the incarnate one, he, he took on flesh, but in taking on flesh, he did not give up any of his godness. He is, he is completely God. He is not junior God. He is not sidekick God. He is fully God in him the fullness of God dwells. And then the, the next, verse 10, we're not going to look at it again, but verse 10 says, and you have been filled in him, which comes to our next point. So all the fullness of God in Jesus, if you are a Christ follower, is now made known to you, which has many implications. We're going to look at, I believe, five of them today, here in a little bit. But, but if, if all of the fullness of God dwells in Jesus and you now are a Christ follower, then, then, then it has all sorts of implication, implications. The fullness of God is now available to you. That's when the spiritual eyes are open. That's when you actually have ears to hear, eyes to see. It actually begins to make sense. So there are all these implications, and that's going to take us right to our next passage. Colossians, uh, we're just going to continue on, verse 13. So I haven't skipped anything. I could have. I could have skipped uh, that circumcision metaphor, but I didn't. You're, you're welcome. All right, verse 13. And you, and you who were dead in your trespasses... In the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Okay, now we're going to, in about five steps, we're going to talk about what Christ has done for you through his work on the cross. And uh, it all falls under this category of him giving you new life. N.T. Wright, solid theologian, he's still alive, he said this, he said, it is utterly characteristic of Pauline theology, stuff that Paul wrote, uh, that at the heart of the description of how people have come to belong to God's family, we should find the cross. In other words, if we talk about people being children of God and people being a part of the family of God, but we, we go around or leave out the story of the cross, we do people a disservice. We are lying to them. If you want to say... That, that you, me, everyone, we are children of the living God, then you have every right to do that. Just don't, don't do that. 
on the basis of the gospel story. If you want to say we are all part of God's family, you have the absolute freedom to do that as a human being. Just don't base it on the gospel story. So N.T. Wright says it's just like Paul when he talks about us being a part of the family of God. It, 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 it always circles around the cross of Christ. All right. Let's look at this in detail. First of all, there is this condition that every one of us formerly lived in, some of us still live in, and that is that we are, we are dead in our trespasses. And, and, then, and then what Christ does is he makes us alive, or God makes us alive in Christ. This condition of us being dead in our trespasses. It is not the main point. The main point is that we have been made alive in Christ. The, the, the deadness that we formerly lived in, those of us that are, that, that are Christ followers, in Paul's writing, um, he loves, Paul loves participles, the words that end in I-N-G in the English language. Loves them. Loves them. He has these incredibly, you grammarians, if you, if you read if you read the, 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 the original language, you'd be so frustrated because it's just a string of run-on sentences with all these participles, I-N-G. But he's always got one main point. Here is the main point. So the main point isn't you guys are dead in your trespasses. It, it, that, that, that's the participle. That it's leading to this main active verb which says you were dead, but now God has made you alive in Christ. Let's talk about trespasses for a moment. Some translations say you were dead in your sins. It's a fine word. Uh, the word that Paul uses in this passage is not the common word, that, or the, the, the most common word for sin. Like amartia is probably the one that's used most often in Greek. This is not it. He uses a different word, and I'm glad that many of the translations use the word trespasses because we are talking about our sins, but it's a, it goes a little bit deeper here. When we use the English word trespasses, we're dead in our trespasses. It, 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 it really means to, our trespasses are all of the ways in which we have, we have stepped <clears throat> outside of the bounds of God's reign. And we've said, I'm going to be my own king. I'm going to be the captain of my own ship. I'm going to determine my own destiny. I'm going to run the show. When we step out of the bounds of God's reign, that really is captured in the essence of this word, <clears throat> trespasses. Sin would also be a fine word, but it doesn't use that common word. It uses a slightly different word, and I think that's important. I think that's what's going on here. As I've, uh, as I've looked at <clears throat> the use of this, this unique um, word for sin that's being tra translated trespasses, as I've looked at it throughout the New Testament, I just did a little bit of a deep dive this week. It seems to me to carry the connotation, now going back to the, our body of flesh, it seems to carry the connotation of, of the body of all of the body of evil work that I have done. Not just what I did this morning that I want to tell you about. <coughs> I'm, I'm sort of kidding. I don't, have, I don't have one evil thing that I, that I did this morning, but I'm sure that I had a number of evil things that I did this morning in hurting people's feelings or in, in just careless ways. But, but this trespasses is not talking about just that one thing that you did. It's talking about the body of work. It's talking about the rap sheet that, 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 that you carry with you. The connotation, again, being uh, the body of evil work. More so than any one act, just the completeness, all the wrong that I have done cumulatively over the course of my life, the mess that I have made, the mess that you have made, are trespasses. But then the change comes, and this is the main verb, God made us alive in 
Christ. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you five steps, what Christ did. You might want to jot this down or take a picture of it because this is, this is what you can use with your friends. How did Christ make you alive? Um, what did he do to make you alive? So we're going to look at the passage one more time. Do I have it there in there again? There we go. Look one more time. And here's, here's just, just, you were dead in your trespasses, dead in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive together with him. And then, and then look at these five points, and then we're going to unpack them. He forgave you your trespasses. Actually, let's just go. Let's just look at the screen. Just look at the the, the the scripture passage, and then we'll go to these. Okay, yeah, right. Forgave you your trespasses. He canceled the record of your debt. He set it aside. He nailed it to the cross, and he disarmed Satan in the process. Okay, I'm going to unpack those briefly, but let's look at them again. He forgave you your trespasses canceled the record of your debt. He set it aside. He nailed it to the cross, and he disarmed Satan in the process. All right, let's look at them one by one. I gave you really confusing notes today. Thank you. You're doing a great job. Number one, and this, the question is, how did Jesus make us alive? How did God make us alive in Christ? What did Jesus do on the cross? Number one, he forgave us our trespasses. We've unpacked that. All, all of the mess that I've made of my life, all of the wrongs that I've done, all of the ways in which I have stepped outside of the bounds of God's reign, he forgave that. Okay, now, how? How? Number two, he, God, in Christ, canceled the record of my debt. Everything that you have done wrong, everything that, that I have done wrong, God, like, like, a, like a benevolent judge in heaven, he has is, he is canceled that debt. The actual word, the actual word, uh, I think, is stronger than canceled. I mean, it is stronger than canceled. Really, in English, it could, be, it could be translated as he obliterated the record of my debt. Or, or he, he destroyed, I'm going to use a different phrase now, the hostile ordinance against me. Some of us, we are running around this world with the sense that, that, <clears throat> that, that people are harsh, people are unforgiving, and I, I, already, I, I already either figuratively or literally serve my time for that. Why do you still define me that way? Why can't, you, uh, why can't we turn over another leaf? Why can't you see me in a different light? I, I have this... I have this weird, uh, I guess it's a complex, I don't know, where like a couple of times in the 15 years or so, more than 15 years that I've lived in my neighborhood, a couple of times, uh, give or take, I, I've, I, my, dogs, my, dogs, my dog has gotten out of the, 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 the yard and it, you know, terrorizes the neighborhood for, a, for like one night and then, because I live in a really uptight neighborhood, like Whatever, you know, like the mayor has to come talk to me or whatever. And I just feel like to this day, I carry that shame. I know it's really weird. It's a really a weird complex, but I, I carry that shame. I feel like, like I'm known as that person in, in, in the neighborhood that I live, like the guy with the rowdy dog who doesn't, you know, doesn't take care of his stuff. And, and so I feel like that defines me. And I, that's kind of lighthearted, although it's true, but but there, the body of work, that the, the, all that you've done in your life, you feel, many of you, like it defines you. And, and so there's shame. And so you feel like there's still a penalty that has to be paid. And, and you carry that in, sometimes in um, subconscious ways. 
you carry that. It defines you. You're, you're shamed by it. And what, what Paul is saying is that God, in making you alive, he has forgiven you, your trespasses, by canceling the record of your debt. There's no more shame. The, the arrest warrant has been stamped canceled. Okay, but how? Like we got to like, like let's see, if this is going to be if this is true, and I want to believe it's true, but but how? Well, it, well, the apostle the apostle Paul goes on and he says by by setting it aside. Think of this like on the table of the courtroom by pushing it aside, saying, you know, okay, this is your this is the uh, the indictment against you, and uh, no, we're just going to put that aside. It's not there anymore. We don't. We're not going to. We're, we're going to. We're going to push it aside. We're not going to actively pursue this indictment any longer. Which that that is a precarious place to be, right? Like there is an indictment against you. But but Paul says God, the, the judge, he pushes it to the side of the desk. And again, let me say that is a precarious place to live because you think, and many of you probably do think this, that, well, one day God might decide to, to bring that indictment back, to, to reinstate the charges. To, if he's only pushed it aside, he might, he might bring it back to the forefront again one day. And, and so that's how many of us live our lives, with this shame and this fear that at any point the other shoe might drop, and at any point God might decide to reinstate the charges against us. And so, so again, God made you alive. Well, how? By forgiving your trespass. Okay, well, but how? By canceling the record of your debt. But, but how? And you say, by setting it aside on the table of the courtroom, and you say, okay, but how? How ultimately, ultimately, how has God made me alive in Christ? And it's not enough to say, it is not enough, friends, to say that, that he has forgiven you. Okay, but how? Well, he canceled the debt. Okay, well, how? Well, he just pushed it aside on his desk. You say, but, but how did he actually make me alive in Christ? And here's where the plane is landed, by nailing it to the cross. And astoundingly, this took place before you ever even existed. God knew what you were going to do before you were ever formed in your mama. And thousands of years ago, perhaps you can make a theological argument that, 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 that in, e in times past eternal, God determined, I will, I will sacrifice my son on the cross, the perfect sacrifice to, to absorb all of my wrath towards sin. I will send Jesus, my son, to do that for the sake of of the world. God so loved, in that manner, God loved the world that he gave his son to die on the cross for your sins, to, to die on the cross for my sins, to, to forgive ultimately and fully our trespasses. You didn't have anything to do with that. I didn't have anything to do with that. God determined to love you in that manner. For God loved the world in this manner, literally is what it says. He gave His Son to die on a cross. So this, this great legal transaction that that, that ultimately imparts life into our formerly dead 
bodies. Now, has, has everyone, this is really important, don't, don't, the rest of what I'm going to say, like that's the high point, that's the high watermark, this is still really important information. I ask a question, has everyone's sins, don't answer out loud, please, has everyone's sins been nailed to the cross? And the very, very serious answer to that question is no. So then you'd have to follow up with, well, then whose sins were nailed to the cross? And for that, we have to go back, and I'm just going to read it. We're not, I don't, we're not going to project it again, but maybe you have it in front of you. We have to go back to verse 12, which says this. Just listen. Close your eyes if it helps you really focus. Verse 12 says this. Having been buried with him, remember him being Jesus, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So the question Whose sins were nailed to the cross? Those who were buried with Christ in baptism. There are all these, there are all, there, there, there are all these wonderful if-then statements in the Bible. We've looked at a number of them over the last, last few weeks. One of them we just looked at. If, if you were baptized with Jesus then you were made alive with Jesus. If you were crucified with Christ, you have been raised to new life in Christ. A a really troubling metaphor that we looked at a few weeks ago is is if, if you suffer with Christ, you will ultimately receive the inheritance that Christ affords you. So all these if-then statements. Is this, is, this, is this available? Is this available to every, every human being, every one of us? Absolutely. How do we access this? Faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus. And then the final, the final um, piece of this whole puzzle, how did Jesus make us alive? By forgiving our trespasses, by canceling the record of our debt, by by setting it aside on the table of the courtroom, by nailing it to the cross, and number five, by disarming the power of the evil one. Finally, um, I'm almost done here. Finally, what I, what I want to most celebrate today is this, that God in Christ has dealt with the two greatest barriers between you and God. God in Christ has dealt with the two greatest barriers between you and God, and they are this. Number one, the record of your guilt, the body of work. The body of work, the, 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 the rap sheet, the stu- all the stuff that you've done, the record of your guilt, that is, number one, the greatest barrier between you, between you and God, and, and God has blown that up. And then the second great barrier between you, you, you and God are the spiritual forces at work against you, and God has obliterated both. Christ has provided full and final Forgiveness. That's what he meant when he said, it is finished. He meant that full and final forgiveness was t- uh, had been dealt with at that point. Christ canceled the record of debt against you. Your debt was like a piece of paper. Man, I can't, I'm going to chase a rabbit here, but I just can't get, I can't get through Colossians with, 
being reminded of this, this precious old man that only few of us know, but, but his name was, was, was Rand Stovall. I remember he used to invite me and several of the young people to, over to his house in the evenings, and he would preach Colossians to us. He's like, look, guys, look, this is what, go, this is what Christ did. He said, he took, he took this, this rap sheet against you, the, the record of your debt. God did that, and he, like, nailed it to the cross. And then he said, if you can just, if you can just, just picture this, young men, he would call us by, by our names, and he would say, Peck, picture this, that Jesus' blood is just running down the cross, and that crimson red just soaks that piece of paper, the, the record of your debt, the, the indictment against you. Jesus' blood covers that, and he soaks it, and it's illegible, and it's canceled, and Jesus did that on the cross for you. Full and final forgiveness. And then the second thing that Christ did in clearing these great hurdles is that Christ is protecting you from the evil one. You're not, you're not subject to the evil one any longer. You may, you may still be um, living like that. Remember a few weeks ago, I talked about this, the fishing story where I take the, the, the hook or the fly out of the fish's mouth and I, I set it there and it's a bit stunned and it, it like doesn't know what to do. And I feel as though I have to say, you're free to go now. You're free to go now. That is, that, is, that is what Christ has done to the power of sin in your life. It no longer has its hooks in you. It no longer controls you. You may live as though you're still a slave to sin, but you're not. You're free to go now. Christ has disarmed the evil one in your life. No longer does Satan have that kind of influence in your life. I, I love, the, I love the, the bold words that the Apostle Paul chooses in this passage, and I want us to embrace it. Christ has openly shamed Satan. Christ has triumphed over Satan. In fact, in fact Christ has shamed Satan by forgiving Satan. You. God is proud of his work in you. Because what he has done in your life has, in the process, secondarily shamed Satan. Embrace that. Take pride in that. He has overcome the evil in your life. Let's live like that. Amen. Would you bow with me and let's pray. God, we celebrate your, your goodness today. God, we celebrate your goodness. Heavenly Father, we celebrate your goodness, not like your Santa Claus who just forgets sins, not like you're an elderly grandpa who just overlooks our sins. You're a benevolent judge. You... You're a loving father. You dealt with our sin. You obliterated the record of sin, the debt held against us. We celebrate you today, God the Father. God the Son, Jesus Christ, we, we say thanks. We, we celebrate the fact that you, although God did not consider heaven and home something to be grasped, but you humbled yourself. Without giving up any of your godness, you humbled yourself. You became like a servant. You submitted yourself willingly uh, to, 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 the, to the will uh, of, of God the Father. You, you came to earth and you died a, sinful, a sinner's death that, that we deserved. We we celebrate you. Not only did you die, but you defeated death in the process. You reanimated yourself. You came back to life. You walked out of the grave. And now you reign and rule in heaven. 
And God, the Holy Spirit, we pray to you today, and we, we, want, to, we want to welcome you here. Of course you're welcome here. You go where you please. We, we welcome you here today in the sense that we, we want to experience you, Holy Spirit. We don't want to miss it. We, we, want to, to, we want to feel. We want to experience. We want to know your, 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 your presence in a more real way, Holy Spirit. You are welcome here today. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we, we pray this prayer wanting to esteem, wanting to lift you up. And we come to the table of communion today to, to that end with the, with the heart's desire to celebrate all that you have done, this saving act in our lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.